Hello and welcome along to Unbelievable. I'm Justin Briley, your host for the show that brings Christians and non-Christians together every week here as part of our programming on Faith Explored as part of Premier Christian Radio's Saturday Output. But lots of people listen to the show via the internet, via the podcast. And if you want to join them, why not go to the website and find the latest program there. Lots of other features and resources too. Not too late to order Unbelievable, the conference on DVD as well. Uh, all of that available from premierchristianradio.com slash unbelievable really exciting show today Uh, not a very Christmassy theme but certainly an interesting one on Hitler was he a Christian was he anti-Christian two guests are going to be duking that out on today's program if you can stick around for the profile straight after unbelievable this afternoon between four and five you'll hear the story of John Lawson former gangster turned Christian amazing story he's got listen out for that uh, with Sam Hales between four and five and uh, don't forget lots of your feedback as well towards the end of today's show if you've sent in an email recently then uh, perhaps in response to science mike on the program last week finding god in the waves his new book uh, in conversation with atheist ben watts uh, you may hear it read out so stick around for that as well and i really hope you enjoy today's program you're unbelievable well on today's program joining me to discuss the question was hitler anti-christian are richard weikart and richard carrier now hitler's religious beliefs or lack of them and to what extent the nazi regime was driven by christian beliefs have long been debated by christians and atheists well i've got a christian and an atheist joining me on the program today to debate that. Richard Weikart is Professor of History at California State University and he's a Senior Fellow for the Centre for Science and Culture of the Discovery Institute. His new book, Hitler's Religion, The Twisted Beliefs That Drove the Third Reich, aimed to show why Hitler was neither an atheist nor a Christian, but a pantheist who believed nature was God. He's going to be explaining that and how that fact drove Hitler's Nazi ideology. Richard Carrier is a historian, atheist activist, author, public speaker and blogger, uh, well known as a proponent of the mythicist view of Jesus. He's been on the show before talking about that. He's also researched the religious views of Hitler and the Nazis, as detailed in his book, Hitler, Homer, Bible, Christ. And there he aimed to show that anti-Christian quotes purportedly made by Hitler are in fact fabrications and that Hitler was happy to be perceived as a Christian throughout his life. Um, So we're going to be discussing Hitler's religious views, how far it influenced the ideology of the Third Reich. Um, Welcome along to the programme, Richard and Richard. Hi. It's, nice to be here. It's, it's great to have you both. Um, we've got uh, Richard W., Richard Weikart, uh, on by Skype and joining us on the phone, Richard Carrier. So I'll come to you, Richard Weikart, first of all. Um, good to have you back again. You seem to be producing a lot of books this year. Um, I had you on earlier in the year uh, on your former book. But um, just tell us a little bit about this particular one, because you've uh, on and off been researching Hitler, the Nazi regime for many years, haven't you? Yes, uh, I, I published uh, a book earlier in 2004 called From Darwin to Hitler, in which the last, only the last chapter was really about Hitler. Most of it was about the social Darwinism, evolutionary ethics in Germany. And then I followed that up in 2009 with a book called Hitler's Ethic, which is a look at Hitler's ideology and showing how evolutionary ethics impacted Hitler's ideology. And it was really while I was doing that book on Hitler's ethic that I became interested in this theme of Hitler's religion because of the back and forth that's been going on between atheists and Christians over was Hitler an atheist, was Hitler a Christian, and then uh, uh, a 2003 book uh, that came out called The Holy Reich sort of stimulated my interest as well. Uh, I I know that much has been made of the fact that um, the Catholic Church in uh, Germany some people say sort of colluded almost with the Nazi regime. Does that come in at all to your book and and that relationship? Well, most of my book, my book is actually focused is specifically on Hitler. I mean, I'm looking at Hitler's ideology, Hitler's religious views. So I don't uh, look at uh, in any great extent, uh, the views of Himmler, Rosenberg. Uh, I mean, I, I mentioned those things, of course, as I'm going through it, as I'm talking about Hitler's uh, ideology. Uh, so I don't really expand it to look at, say, the role of Pius the the Twelfth, and it, again, except as it impinges just on Hitler himself. So I try to keep the focus very tightly on Hitler in the book. Last year, Whoopi Goldberg um, was on a a chat show and kind of brought up that thing which a lot of people sort of assume or, or is, is certainly does the rounds online that well didn't you know hitler was a christian um so in short what what's your case for people who say that why why would you say actually no hitler wasn't a christian even though to some it may have looked like he was 
Well, the reason, of course, they say he was a Christian was because there were a number of occasions, and one of the most commonly quoted one comes from an April 1922 speech of Hitler, where Hitler called Jesus his Lord and Savior. You have in the Nazi 25-point program uh, their claim that they were representative, positive Christianity. So there were public, there were some things where Hitler was trying to uh, bring himself close to Christianity. Uh, but if you look at all of his private conversations, if you look at his uh, testimony of all of his associates, none of his associates who've written anything, either in their diaries, and we do have some diaries of people who were written at the time, as well as subsequently, none of them claim that he was Christian. And in fact, they argue exactly the opposite. They claim he was anti-Christian. Uh, and even in public, they're in Mein Kampf and in some speeches, uh, Hitler makes anti-Christian comments at a number of times, too. So it seems to me there's overwhelming evidence that he was more anti-Christian than Christian. So if he wasn't a Christian, was he an atheist? That's, that's the other side of this that's often put forward. Yeah, and that uh, that I would actually agree with uh, Richard Carrier on that uh, particular issue, because I think uh, Christians who assume that Hitler was an atheist because he wasn't a Christian are jumping to a wrong conclusion, too. Hitler, I think, did have a sincere belief in some kind of God. And that, again, if you look again at, at the evidence from his own associates, from private conversations he had, I mean, the evidence seems to point overwhelmingly to the fact that he did believe in some kind of higher being or higher power. Uh, but it wasn't the Christian God. In fact, I argue it was uh, pantheism, that is, the, that nature is God. We'll get you to unpack a bit about how that would have driven, you know, his particular ideology and so on. Um, what, what fed into that as well? I, I mean, very briefly, can you give us a sense of what kind of religious influences impinged on him as he grew up and, and how that fed into what would become his sort of pantheism, as you call it? As I show in my book, Hitler's Religion, uh, pantheism was pretty widespread in German and on the intellectual elites throughout the course of the 19th century and on into the early 20th century. And there's been a good deal of scholarship uh, showing that. Uh, so it wasn't like an unusual, weird kind of view uh, for a, a German to take who's uh, widely read. Uh, and Hitler did read voraciously. Uh, so Hitler, at, of course, he was baptized as a Catholic. He was confirmed as a Catholic, although there are actually some evidence that he wasn't too uh, happy with the Catholic Church even at that point when he went through his confirmation uh, ceremony. Uh, his dad was a free thinker, though, uh, so his dad uh, was anti-Catholic uh, pretty much. His mom was very pious, though, so in growing up he sort of had some mixed uh, influences coming in from his family uh, situation. But after he left home, there's no evidence that he ever attended church uh, uh, after that point, except for funerals, weddings, special occasions like that. Uh, and if you read Hitler's Vienna by Brigitte Hamann uh, and a scholarship about Hitler during the First World War, all of it points, all of the scholars who've uh, written on that suggest that even from a very young age, he was pretty, uh, anti uh, pretty antagonistic toward the Catholic Church and his upbringing. So even though he never left the Catholic Church, there was never, as far as I'm aware, excommunicated um, as far as you can see, he was either very nominal or even uh, antagonistic at some level towards it. Yes, and uh, Joseph Goebbels also never left the Catholic Church, uh, even though he's very obviously antagonistic toward it. Uh, read his diaries, read uh, other, many other th conversations he had. Uh, so uh, this was not an unusual thing. Ernst Haeckel, in fact, I, I bring up some examples in my book about it too. Ernst Haeckel, for example, who was a uh, the leading German Darwinian biologist in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, never left the Protestant Church until 1910, after he'd been criticizing it for 40 or 40 years or more. Uh, so it was not, wasn't an unusual thing for people not to leave the church, even though they had rejected the church's teachings. Well, thank you very much for joining me on the program today. And uh, we're going to be joined by another Richard now, Richard Carrier, um, who is great to have in conversation with Richard Weikart. Richard Carrier has also done quite a bit of research on the issue of Hitler's religion. Um, Richard, welcome along again to the program today. Um, what got you interested initially in looking into some of the historical arguments about whether Hitler was or wasn't a Christian? Well, it started uh, many years ago when I was in graduate school. Uh, I was studying ancient history and, and the origins of Christianity and ancient science and so forth. And one of the things that I was doing, of course, is learning how to translate uh, scholarly articles in other languages. And so Dan Barker of the Freedom From Religion Foundation knew about this, and he kept getting these quotes thrown at him by Christians that, in which Hitler is basically uh, radically anti-Christian and essentially making Hitler look like an atheist. And he wanted me to research whether those quotes, uh, the English translations, were accurate translations of the Germans. 
And that led me to discover that, in fact, uh, they were not. Um, that, in fact, there were uh, d- huge distortions in the English translation uh, commissioned by Hugh Trevor Roper. So th- it's the only English translation available uh, in print, which is called Hitler's Table Talk. It's unreliable in this regard. And that, that's a whole other long story unto itself. Um, and then when you go back and look at the actual German, you find the reality is much more complicated and nuanced. I believe that this particular chapter that, that became part of your, your wider book, Hitler, Homo, Bible, Christ, has sort of um, had a bit of an update this year as well, um, that the person who, were, as it were, is behind that book, um, it's it's been seen that actually uh, your research has, uh, you know, played into a new understanding of Hitler's table talk. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my original research I published in German Studies Review back in 2003, and ever since that, it's actually had an impact on the whole field of Hitler studies. Uh, Richard Steigman Gall, for example, cites it uh, in his book, and, and so does Weikart. Weikart mentions uh, my research and how it impacts how we understand the table talk, uh, and leads, I think has led to more responsible use of that source, uh, even in Weikart's book. Um, and then now, uh, lately, in the past few years, uh, Professor Mikhail Nielsen of Uppsala University in Sweden uh, has picked up this mantle. Because uh, what I did in my articles, I, I I published in German Studies Review what I found and that it's a problem and that more research is needed. So Nielsen is now doing that more research, and he's actually uncovering all kinds of things. He's digging through archives and so forth and and is learning more and more about uh, the path of the manuscripts of the Table Talk and how they came to exist and the fact that there was actually worries about the English translation being inaccurate uh, that were kept hidden from the public for many years. So there's there's a whole other backstory to this. I the, talked these, about on the so the, this table talk um, book was supposedly based on notes taken by some of Hitler's associates as he sort of spoke at the table, as it were, about his beliefs about Correct. religion and so on. Um, and, but there, there's been a lot of doubt cast upon whether a um the translation was correct in the first place um as i understand it but then even sort of the fact that these notes were actually written down the day after and and probably probably involved something of a reconstitution of what he may or may not have said but it's fascinating stuff and obviously as a historian the kind of thing you're interested in doing um I, I, i i mean as regards the general tenor of Hitler towards Christianity, though, what's your overall takeaway? Um, obviously, you, you don't believe he said some of the very anti-Christian things that, that have commonly been associated with him. But, but what, what, was, what is your view about, about where he stood in terms of religion? Well, what I've found is that uh, all the passages that even Weikert uh, presents of him attacking Christianity are actually attacking Catholicism and church-based religion. Uh, and so this, we have this confusion here between being anti-Christian and being anti-Catholic or anti-Church. There are lots and lots of Christians, millions and millions of Christians even today, who are anti-Catholic and anti-Church and say almost the exact same kinds of things that Hitler said against institutionalized religion, against sectarianism, uh, against uh, Catholic uh, doctrines and so forth, such as worship of saints or transubstantiation and so on. So we really, if we're going to look at the text, we have to tease out this difference between how Hitler used the word in German Christentum. Does he mean Christianity in this broad, abstract sense that we mean right now in this conversation? Or did he mean, in fact, actually institutionalized Christianity, Catholicism and the major churches? And usually it's almost always he's attacking Catholicism. Uh, and when we look at his views, we see the backstory that he's, he definitely was anti-Catholic in private. In public, he was not so much. In public, he really tried to play up his Catholicism. But in private, he was totally reversed on that and actually was advocating, and we can show this point by point by point, that his positions were very much in line with this very sort of bizarre sect of Christianity called positive Christianity uh, developed by uh, Nazis and Nazi sympathizers in the early 20th century. So you still believe whatever he believed about Catholicism, he still held some sort of, uh, albeit warped, view of Christianity? Yeah. Yeah. I would, uh, yeah, that's my view of it for okay. sure. Well, we, we'll come back to Richard Weikart in a moment's time and and see what he has to say in response to this. Um, looking forward to this. Uh, it often comes up in all kinds of conversations here on Unbelievable. The the Hitler card uh, often it's uh, invoked as Godwin's law. If you play Hitler, then you've automatically lost the debate. I think is the rule. But we're we're not playing that one on today's <laughs> show. That would be uh, that would be a bit a bit tough. Um, but um, uh, if you want to get involved in the debate, of course, as ever, you can get in touch via email or. Send me a message via Facebook and uh, and Twitter. Uh, be be pleased to hear from you uh, if you've got a take on the question of Hitler, his religion. Was he uh, 
Christian, anti-Christian, something else. Um, do email in unbelievable at premier.org.uk. Be interested to hear from you. Uh, Facebook.com slash unbelievable JB is the way to follow on Facebook. Uh, send me a message that way. And of course, the Twitter at unbelievable JB to follow on Twitter. Unbelievable with Justin Brierley. And don't forget, you can get in touch uh, via the website. Uh, so do find the latest show. Links to both my guests, Richard Weikart and Richard Carrier, and their various uh, works to do with today's discussion at premierchristianradio.com slash unbelievable. We're asking today, was Hitler anti-Christian? Not a very Christmassy show, I will admit. <laughs> We've got something much more Chris, Chris, <laughs> much more Christmassy for you uh, on Christmas Eve next week. But um, but for the moment, this is coming out of the back of um, the fact Richard Weikart has a new book out. Uh, Richard Weikart is Professor of History at California State University and uh, his new book, Hitler's Religion, The Twisted Beliefs That Drove the Third Reich, aims to show Hitler was neither an atheist nor a Christian, but a pantheist who believed nature was God. Now, um, what we just heard there from Richard Carrier, Richard W., is that um, as far as he can see, uh, Rich, uh, certainly Hitler seemed in private anti-Catholic, anti-church, the institution, but not necessarily anti-Christian. He held a sort of Christian belief himself, um, perhaps this uh, Christian positivism that, that was popular. Um, what, what's your take on that? Well, first of all, I think we need to define what Christianity is, and that's been a big problem, I think, in the debate here over because if we're going to argue, you know, was Hitler anti-Christian, we need to know what we're talking about. And in my book, I use the World Council of Churches definition of Christianity, which is the claim that Christ is divine, that is, that Christ is deity, uh, as well as that there is a triune God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so I use that as sort of just a very basic uh, definition of Christianity. And if you look at Hitler's uh, discussions about Jesus and about Christianity, uh, there is absolutely no evidence that Hitler believed that Jesus was divine, and in fact, there's a lot of evidence to suggest he didn't think that Jesus was divine. For example, uh, this is just one of the stronger pieces of evidence, but I mean, I have a lot of it in my book. Uh, in a speech that Hitler gave in 1926, he made the comment that the work which Christ had begun but could not finish, he, meaning Hitler, would complete. So Hitler thought that when Jesus, Hitler believed that Jesus existed, certainly. And in fact, by the way, uh, Hitler did actually uh, have actually a positive view of, of Jesus when he talks about Jesus. He actually thinks of Jesus as being a, a noble Aryan fighter. He thought Jesus was not Jewish. He thought Jesus was an Aryan fighter uh, who was fighting against the Jews. And he thought that Jesus was anti-Semitic. And so he, he actually does uh, speak positively about Jesus, but he doesn't think that Jesus died on the cross for his sins. He doesn't think that Jesus rose from the dead. He criticizes the idea of Jesus' resurrection very directly. Uh, and he, uh, at one point, uh, Goebbels, just to give another example, uh, and the one I just quoted about him, you know, Jesus, the work that, uh, that Jesus had, was not able to complete. Hitler saw Jesus as being a martyr. He was killed by the Jews, uh, but uh, that was it. And, Hitler, and Jesus had not been able to complete his work of just trying to destroy the Jews, essentially. Uh, so Hitler didn't believe that Jesus had accomplished, uh, you know, his death on the cross or resurrection was a reality. And then let me just give another quotation from May 1943. This is according to Goebbels' diaries. Uh, Goebbels said that Hitler had said, The idiocy of the Christian doctrine of salvation is for our time completely unusable. Nonetheless, there are scholars, educated people, and men in high positions in public life who hang on to it as to a childhood faith. That even today, one views the Christian doctrine of salvation as giving direction through a difficult life is completely incomprehensible. So Hitler attacked some of the most basic doctrines of Christianity, and, and not just Catholic doctrines. Yes, he did attack the doctrine of transubstantiation, as Richard Carrier suggested, but he also attacked the doctrine of salvation. He attacked the doctrine of believing in the Bible. He, he rejected the Old Testament as Jewish. He rejected uh, all the Pauline epistles because he thought Paul was a sneaky Jewish rabbi who had snuck Bolshevik ideas into Christianity from the very start. So he rejected Christianity from the time Paul on. You know, he, he, again, he idealized Jesus. And so if that makes a person a Christian, but the Muslims do too. Muslims think Jesus was a prophet. Uh, so, you know, what is identifiably Christian about Hitler's views? I, I, it's not there. OK, really interesting. Um, OK, so Richard Carrier, uh, to all intents and purposes, Hitler didn't have any kind of what would be considered even a basic kind of 
Christian beliefs. So, so even if he kind of had some views about Jesus, they certainly couldn't have been described as Christian ones. What, what's your take on that? Well, I think that's a typical example of excluding a bunch of Christians. I mean, we're now excluding from the definition of Christians Mormons, Unitarians, Quakers, Jehovah's Witnesses, Branch Davidians, People's Temple. Uh, so Christianity is a much more diverse uh, group of sectarian beliefs. Not all Christians agree with the divinity of Jesus. Not all Christians believe in the divinity of Jesus, even at the beginning of Christianity. Uh, so, uh, so I think that's a little too narrow to actually analyze this stuff. When you, if you want to look at the actual backstory, the sort of historical context in which his, Hitler's views arose, we have to look at this development of what's called positive Christianity. It's a, it was a German nationalist version of Christianity. Uh, it had some similarities with you find a lot of racist versions of Christianity today than the white power movement, for example. But it's this idea, it was adopted officially by the Nazi party in its 25-point program in 1925, so it was actually very public promoting this. And they had these weird beliefs. They definitely were weird. Uh, Jesus was an Aryan who was speaking truth to power against the Jews, uh, and they believed that Paul had corrupted the true religion taught by Jesus and made it too Jewish. And this was actually, this was before Hitler that they actually defined this stuff. And it was anti- anti-institutionalist, anti-sectarian, and very anti-Catholic. And it believed in unifying all Christian sects under a single sect that would be uh, supportive of the state, um, unified with the state. So they had this, this idea. When we look at the teachings of Hitler, or the things that Hitler says in private, uh, he says exactly the same thing. He says Jesus was an Aryan who spoke truth to power against the Jews, that Paul corrupted the religion and converted it into Catholicism, which was uh, filled with elaborate Jewish superstitions and, and elaborate Jewish rites, and all of the other things, the anti-institutionalism, the anti-sectarianism. So the, especially those particular doctrines, the idea that Paul corrupted and Judaized religion and turned it into Catholicism, uh, and that Jesus was an Aryan, these are very odd beliefs in the context, the galaxy of Christian sectarian beliefs, and yet they're very peculiar to positive Christianity. So to see Hitler in private promoting these specific doctrines of positive Christianity tells us that he was very much aligned with this particular sect of Christianity. And yes, you can certainly say it's a perversion of the original teachings of Christianity, but you could say that about a lot of different uh, sectarian schisms within Christianity throughout history. And it really did grow out of this. When we look at, for example, this idea of opposing and destroying the Jews, the program, Hitler's program against the Jews, line by line by line, is identical to Martin Luther's program against the Jews. And positive Christianity was very much taking things that they wanted out of Lutheranism, which they regarded as the true, the, the truer version of Christianity within uh, the German tradition. They took pieces of Lutheranism and, and imported it into this new sect, this sort okay. of sect throughout of Lutheran Christianity. If, if I could bring in Richard what Wy- Weikart at this point, because I, I think you've, you've spat out very well there, but and Richard, the main point being, you, you, you're defining Christianity too narrowly. Uh, this was a form of Christianity, even though you, you see it as a, a bar, you know, aberrant and, I guess, heretical um, when it when it comes to the the standard definition of Christianity. So, I don't know what. It'd be interesting to know. Do you have a good reason to say no? That is not Christian. If it crosses this particular line, you can't. You can no longer describe Hitler's beliefs as as Christian. Well, everything that Richard Carey said there, and also in, in an earlier article that I, I read of his, where he talks about Jesus, uh, excuse me, Hitler believing in God, Jesus, uh, providence, and uh, immortality, uh, immortality of the soul. All of those things could be said about a Muslim, for example. And in fact, by the way, Hitler actually made positive comments about Islam. He actually said that he, uh, and think about Christian and his anti-Christian ideas. He actually said it, it was a disaster that the the uh, the Muslims lost the Battle of Tours because he thought Islam was. Uh, a, pr- a religion to be preferred to Christianity because it was more of a martial uh, fighting religion and such. So, I mean, if we're going to include all these things in Christianity that uh, Richard Carey wants to uh, suggest are part of Christianity, then I think you just pretty much opened the door to uh, just not defining Christianity at all and just anything, anyone that believes in God, anything about Jesus, immortality of the soul, then they become Christian. And that's simply, that makes the word Christian meaningless. Um, what about this the, 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 this anti-Semitic strain that obviously he wanted to draw out? Uh, we, and, and Richard uh, Carey's view is he was simply kind of carrying on what Martin Luther began, who obviously as much as he was revered as, uh, you know, the founder of the Reformation, he had some pretty anti-Semitic views as well, if you read his, his writings. Yes, and uh, Richard Carey is correct that there were quite a number of things in Luther's writings that were carried out under the Nazis. Uh, of course, any time uh, hatred against the Jews is... 
uh, put forward. There's going to be obvious kinds of things uh, that are going to be proposed. And, and by the way, I, I certainly agree with Richard Carrier uh, that Luther's anti-Semitism was a horrible thing, and Catholic anti-Semitism, not just Luther, by the way, there's a lot of Catholic anti-Semitism going on throughout the Middle Ages that was going on up into the 19th and 20th century. And I would also agree with, I th I'm pretty sure Richard Carrier would agree with me here, uh, that a lot of that was uh, did have an impact on the development of anti-Semitism uh, of Hitler. So I'm, I'm not claiming, by the way, and, and in my uh, book, Hitler's Religion, I make it clear uh, that Catholic traditions of anti-Semitism, and I think that's actually more influential on Hitler personally. Again, I'm looking at Hitler personally. That's more influential than Lutheran, uh, since Hitler was not raised Lutheran, and there's a Hitler never actually even references Luther's anti-Semitism, interestingly, even though a lot of people make a lot of it. I certainly agree, and I think Richard Kerr would agree with me here, that that was a horrible influence on uh, anti-Semitism in the 19th and 20th century. So I certainly agree that Hitler was influenced by that. I'm not trying to say there was no influence uh, of this Christian anti-Semitism on Hitler. However, there was, uh, it was, there was one very important distinction that got made in the mid-19th century by uh, anti-Semites who began secularizing anti-Semitism, and who actually, by the way, uh, coined the term anti-Semitism. The term anti-Semitism didn't exist until uh, the 1870s, I believe, somewhere in the mid-19th century anyway. Uh, and they secularized anti-Semitism by construing the Jews as being a biological entity, not a religious entity. And so what Luther, Luther's proposal for the Jews was that they should convert to Christianity and become assimilated into uh, German culture and society. Hitler's solution for the—Hitler thought that was the absolute worst thing that could happen. He did not want the Jews converting to Christianity and assimilating into German society because he saw them as a biological entity, and that would bring their—what he saw as bad and inferior biological traits into the German gene pool. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be back with my guests. We're talking about whether Hitler was anti-Christian. My guests are Richard Weikart and Richard Carrier, both uh, involved in history. Both have studied this particular area and we'll be continuing as a Richard Carrier responds in the next section of the programme to, uh, to what's been said so far. Uh, look forward to you joining us again in a short moment's time. Is your tinsel looking tired? Does your nativity need a new lease of life? Then do not fear. In the latest edition of Premier Christianity magazine, we've 101 fresh ideas for Christmas in your church. OK, it's about 27 really. But you'll also find amazing stories of near-death experiences, why culture is turning against porn, and how you can make sure your pastor doesn't burn out. All that plus much more. Request a free sample copy of the December magazine at premierchristianity.com slash free sample. You're listening to Unbelievable on Premier Christian Radio. Welcome back to today's programme. Don't forget that uh, Unbelievable is available online. If you'd like to listen back to today's programme, pass it on to a friend, subscribe to the podcast, uh, find more about us online at Facebook, Twitter and so on. Uh, do go to the website premierchristianradio.com slash unbelievable. I'm Justin Briley and uh, look forward to reading out some of your thoughts on recent shows that have taken place towards the end of today's program and straight after unbelievable on the profile you can hear another christian talking about their walk of life and faith uh, that's this afternoon between four and five uh, today on the program we're asking was hitler anti-christian a new book by richard weikart uh, called hitler's religion the twisted beliefs that drove the third reich aims to show why hitler was neither an atheist nor a christian as atheists and christians sometimes claim uh, but a pantheist who believed nature was god we'll get more from him on that so richard carrier is in conversation with him richard carrier is a historian himself an atheist activist author public speaker and blogger and um, in his book hitler homer bible christ he aimed to show that anti-christian quotes often used by christians to show hitler was not a christian were in fact uh, fabrications they can't be trusted um, in terms of the original source material hitler's table talk as it's called um, uh, but just in that last section of the program uh, richard carrier richard weikart again hitting home the point here that as far as he's concerned there's you know if you open the door to what Hitler believed about Jesus and Christianity as being called Christianity, then then you simply swing the door too wide. You might as well call Islam Christianity. And and also this this point that he made about 
Yes, of course, um, the the anti-Semitism of Luther was regrettable, though as far as Richard Weikart's concerned, not necessarily that great an influence on Hitler, probably more the anti-Semitism through, uh, the, in Catholicism that, that, that influenced him. Um, anyway, lots to respond to there. Where, where do you want to begin? Well, I would just focus on this idea that we're trying to define Christianity in such a way that we can excuse Christianity from blame for any of this, which obviously I think even Weikert agrees that we shouldn't be going that far. If we're going to say that positive Christianity, which was definitely believed and promoted as a Christian sect and regarded as a Christian sect by the Germans and and beyond uh, at the time, if we're going to say that positive Christianity is a a perversion of Christianity so far that it is therefore no longer Christianity— and we actually have to say the same thing about Hitler's racial Darwinism, that it was, it's actually going so far against what Darwin said that it's the perversion of Darwinism and that that's not really Darwinism. Uh, when we look at uh, Darwin's teachings on moral intelligence, and there's um, Vincent D'Anorchia writes a really good article on this for Philosophy Now online. People want to look at this. Darwin on moral intelligence, he says. Uh, it's, you can really see, and you, if you compare this to what Hitler said, uh, Hitler said, for example, that man is superior to the animals because he rec- recognizes a creative power. Darwin said that man is superior to the animals because he recognizes the cruelty of Darwinism and thus has sympathy for his fellows, which actually elevates them above the animals. There's no mention in uh, Darwinian thought of Jews being an inferior race or a threat to be eradicated, or even saying that of any race whatsoever. The whole idea of rationalizing this is not Darwinian at all. Instead, Darwin advocated that moral cooperation in society, helping the weak, is an evolved trait and therefore actually a superior trait, and therefore because it's better than war and killing each other. The idea of turning this around and actually perverting this into some sort of racialized, war-supporting, uh, eradicating a race concept and turning it against the Jews, that all came from Christianity. And Hitler, like I said, Hitler's program against the Jews is really matching up with Christian programs against the Jews. It did not come from the Darwinian side of his thoughts. Now, he racialized it. He tried to turn it into some sort of scientific excuse for it. Uh, but he also gave Christian excuses for it. And he actually, these things, he's merging them two together. And yes, indeed, creating a perverted form of Christianity uh, that doesn't look like the kind of Christianity that Weikert wants to exist, and it certainly doesn't look like uh, the kind of Darwinism that, that actual scientists were promoting. I mean, this this plays into other research you've done um, on the influence of Darwinism, social Darwinism, on Hitler, uh, the eugenics of the Nazi regime, and so on, Richard Weikart. Uh, but mm-hmm. yeah, I guess Richard Carey saying that you can't have your cake and eat it. If you're not if you're not going to allow Hitler to be a Christian, then Hitler wasn't a Darwinist either. Um, and and so don't don't start to say that you know he was you know pursuing some form of social darwinism if since since it could be easily argued he, it was a very perverse form of, of that what yeah in, it's an interesting comeback what, what's well, your take on that yeah I, i'm glad he raised this point i mean i think we need to get our definitions down once again and i do define in my scholarship on my book from darwin to hitler and hitler's ethic i do define darwinism i define it very carefully uh i define darwinism as a belief in the transmutation of species that is taking place through the process of natural selection That's how I define Darwinism. And if you look at Hitler's writings, you'll find that that's exactly what he believed. Now, it's true uh, that Hitler's form of Darwinism, his racialized form of Darwinism, is not going to be the same as uh, the the forms of egalitarian, racially egalitarian Darwinism that some people are going to be espousing today, such as Richard Carrier. Uh, But nonetheless, it was a form of Darwinism. Uh, His claim that Hitler's beliefs were a form of Christianity, though, uh, is, uh, I think, quite different. Again, because if we, uh, again, if he wants to define, he he defines Christianity so broadly that I suppose it does work that way. Uh, But if we define Christianity, if we define Christianity in the way that I do, World Council of Churches definition of Christianity, which is a pretty widely accepted definition, uh, and which is a pretty broad definition, pretty, it's considered an ecumenical definition. And yes, it does exclude Mormons. It does exclude Jehovah's Witnesses. There are people that excludes, as he's suggesting, uh, but it is a pretty standard definition of Christianity that's uh, being used. Uh, and if you look at Hitler's own statements about using the word Christianity, okay, because we, Hitler uses the word Christianity himself. When Hitler uses the word Christianity, it's always negative, except in public speeches where he's trying to appeal to the public, and not even always then, by the way. Uh, in Mein Kampf, let me just give one example here from Mein Kampf. And I'll get back to the Darwinism issue in just a second. But in Mein Kampf, uh, Hitler, so this is a public writing. There's no disputing the the source material here or anything like that. He's talking about the origins of Christianity. He says, 
a philosophy filled with infernal intolerance. And by the way, this is interesting because Hitler uh, saw Catholicism and the and, and Christianity as a whole it, it, as a intolerant religion. Hmm. Okay, and he's hmm. critic and he criticizes it for its intolerance. And this that's actually he shares with uh, atheist critics. And he's very similar. He's, he, Hitler liked the Enlightenment thinkers like. Uh, Frederick the Great and Voltaire and others for their critiques of Christianity, Christian intolerance. And so he says here, philosophy filled with infernal intolerance will only be broken by a new idea, driven forward by the same spirit, championed by the same mighty will, and at the same time pure and absolutely genuine in itself. Of course, he's talking about Nazism, replacing it here. Mm. And then he goes on to say, the individual may establish with pain today that with the appearance of Christianity, so here he's talking about what he means by Christianity, with the appearance of Christianity, the first spiritual terror entered into the far freer ancient world. But he will not be able to contest the fact that since then, the world has been afflicted and dominated by this coercion, and that coercion is broken only by coercion, and terror only by terror. Only then can a new state of affairs be constructively created. So when Hitler uses the word Christianity, he sees it as, he calls it here, a spiritual terror that is afflicting the world. So uh, the claim that Hitler is buying into this positive Christianity, that was, that was eyewash. That was just for the public uh, to get them on board so that he didn't offend them. And he even says this, by the way, when he was in prison with Hess. He told Hess, I'm playing the religious hypocrite, you know, because I don't want my uh, movement to be destroyed by taking an anti-Christian position. But when, he, when Hitler uses the word Christianity... He uses it and he, he calls it spiritual terror that is afflicting the world. And, and generally, do you think that's always the case with with Hitler's other speeches, which is, I've heard atheist quote to me where he where he kind of seems to um, uphold the church in some way or another. Was it always essentially politically motivated as far as you can see? As far as I can tell, it, it, it's always public. It, it, again, in private, he never makes these kinds of pro-Christian statements. There's absolutely no evidence from any private source that any of his associates, his colleagues, memoirs, uh, 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 diaries, and like Goebbels' diaries and Rosenberg's diaries that we have do talk about Hitler's conversations and his relations about uh, religion. Uh, and in none of those places does he... Uh, does he uh, make any kind of pro-Christian statements, but actually speaks against Christianity and uses the word Christianity and speaks against what he sees as Christianity? OK, we, we will come back to the Darwinism thing. But do you want to respond to to, to that um, view on on Hitler's uh, Christianity or uh, and the, the view there, that Richard Carey, that, that evidently when you look at passages like that in Mein Kampf, whatever he may have given lip service to in terms of Christianity, be it official or the, this positive Christianity, he, he obviously saw it overall as a blight it's hardly glowing terms that he's describing the advent of christianity in there in mein kampf is it well look at the context he's talking about catholicism he's talking about the use of coercion he's talking about depressing heresy uh so he's actually talking about the context of this perversion that paul created that led to the catholic church that led to persecution of non-agreeing sects this is anti-sectarianism. This is not anti-Christian uh, view. So this is, and there are a lot of Christians who agree with this. There's a lot of Christians who are also uh, against hell. The use of hell doctrine to terrorize people is something that Hitler criticized. There are a lot of Christians who also uh, criticize that use uh, within Christianity. They're not anti-Christian. Uh, they're just against a particular Christian doctrine. And this is the context that Hitler's talking about. He's talking about Catholicism. This is positive Christianity creeping through. Uh, this idea that Catholicism was a perversion of the true religion and that it resulted in this kind of uh, this terror on society where they're actually using force to coerce people to believe. And Hitler actually advocated this idea that people should not have to be coerced, which is ironic, considering what he did. Mm. Uh, but what his, his preaching was was this idea that all the Christian sects should get rid of their dogmas and they should all be unified, that there shouldn't be sectarianism, uh, that there should just be uh, one free religion. And he, he, you know, he often talked in glowing terms about this future state of the world where everybody will be in agreement, that'll be uh, wonderful, and there won't be these doctrines, and there won't be these, this, the use of coercion won't be necessary anymore, and all of this stuff. Um, I think that's utopian and ridiculous of him to think that, considering all the horrible things that he was doing to coerce people. Uh, but that, 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 you know, there's a disconnect between his behavior and his beliefs in this regard. But definitely this is the thing that he's talking about. He's talking about Catholicism. He's talking about coercion. He's talking about institutionalized religion. He's talking about sectarianism. He's not lambasting the idea that there should be a Christian society or that he should be a Christian. I mean, I guess my question, Richard Carrier, is, is what's left once he's kind of, you know, dismissed all of the 
whatever his views were of the Catholic Church and Christ, uh, you know, Christian doctrines, you know, have, 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 you know, if he's saying none of that is true, uh, it's all a perversion of what he, he obviously had this, this bizarre Aryan view of Jesus and so on. I mean, all, all you, it feels to me all you're left with is a very strange kind of dogma that essentially was there to prop up his particular type of racism. Um, and I don't know, I can understand Richard Weikart feeling like, well, calling that Christianity is, is a bit of a stretch. It's, it's obviously something that seems like a useful sort of thing to, 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 to kind of use as, as an ideological uh, uh, framework for for what he wanted to do with the world i mean do do you really think he did think of himself as a christian is is that really kind of what you you think he he genuinely thought i am a christian because i have these views yeah and he would if someone were to probe he would say you know i i if, if you were to be honest he would say i i espouse and agree with the views of positive christianity uh, which it believed in that the nature was created by god and, and that all of nature's laws were put in place by god and represent god's will uh, that God had providence for the world, and that Hitler was at his actions against the Jews is actually part of God's providence. Uh, he believed that he was going to go to heaven. Uh, he talks about how he expects to go to heaven and live with heroes rather than weaklings, enlightened spirits, and some sort of Olympus. He says, uh, and it, so he had this. He had different views than some Christians about who would go to heaven and things like that. But he did expect this, and he expected this because he fulfilled God's law. It, it sounds like what, what you described there, though, is, is essentially what Richard Weikart calls pantheism. And so you're kind of using just different words for the same, the same religious views. Well, he's, no, it's definitely, it's definitely a personal God. Uh, pantheism uh, is the view that nature and God are the same thing. Uh, Hitler very clearly distinguished nature as a created thing and not as identical with God. I mean, he talks about nature being created, that there's a creative power, that there's providence that's separate from uh, and that is realized through god's creation and navigation of nature uh and that god is a personal being and that there's going to be an afterlife pantheists don't usually uh, adhere to that concept so when you look at all of these elements it's definitely looking a lot more like a proper theism at least uh and it's already it's got all these elements of christianity in it that he's borrowed he's he's taken the pieces of christianity that he wants and, and ditched the pieces of christianity that he doesn't just like every other sect that splits off uh, and creates its own version of Christianity. Sure, sure. Okay, uh, Rich, Richard Weikart, it's not pantheism. Whatever it was, it, it's not pantheism, says Richard Carrier. What's your response to that? Well, Hitler does, of course, use the term God, providence, uh, quite freely in a number of places, and the word creator as well. In fact, I have a, a whole chapter in my book called uh, Was Hitler a Creationist? Because this has been thrown at me, too, that Hitler was a creationist, because he does use the word creator at various times. What's interesting, though, if you look at those particular passages, like in Mein Kampf and in Hitler's second book and, and elsewhere, where he's actually talking about those things, he does tend to deify nature. In fact, interestingly, the, the translators of Mein Kampf even capitalize the word nature uh, in those contexts. Now, we don't know if Hitler would have done that because he capitalized all nouns, because that's how German is written. Uh, but certainly they recognized that there was something more to it than just uh, nature as nature. And in Mein Kampf, the, the word nature and God get used interchangeably in a number of occasions. And in the, in the passage where Hitler talks about how by fighting against the Jews, I'm doing the work of the Lord, in the context there, it gives... Uh, it is talking about nature and uh, about the aristocratic, what he calls the aristocratic laws of nature. And the very sentence in front of that, it says that eternal nature avenges uh, the transgression of its commands. That's a paraphrase. I'm not going to exact quote, but it's very close to that. Uh, but he does use the term eternal nature there, as, as well as a number of other passages. And I give a number of examples of this in my, in my book, Hitler's Religion. So if nature is eternal, as Hitler uh, is saying that it is, uh, then it wasn't created by some other kind of being. It's, there's no, it, it, that makes Hitler not a deist, not a theist, because there's no, nothing creating nature. Nature itself becomes the creative agent. So when Hitler's talking about creator, he's actually identifying that with nature. He sees nature itself as being creative. And I do agree with Richard Carey, by the way, that he saw himself as obeying the divine will, but the divine will was the laws of nature, because he thought the Darwinian struggle for existence was one of the highest laws of nature that he needed to try to fulfill. And so he, he actually saw himself as driving evolution forward uh, by uh, doing uh, the by killing people who he considered inferior, whether it be the Jews, whether it be people with disabilities, the Sinti, the Roma uh, or Slavs or anyone else. I, I mean, what I'm getting from you then is, is, OK, he was not an atheist. 
he was not a theist. He was this this pantheist. Right. And it's interesting to hear you talk about this because one of my other heroes, uh, contemporaneously with Hitler, of course, is C.S. Lewis, who talks an awful lot more than apologists do today about pantheism in some of his books. So it's obviously a kind of a going concern of the sort of 1930s and 40s and so on. This this particular view of nature and God. But but the 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 the, the thing I'm getting from you is is that because he he. He was not a materialist, a, a naturalist in that sense, uh, as, as I guess someone like Richard Carrier is, and, and who would see um, the, the evolution and uh, Darwinism as simply something that happens and something we, we, we are subject to, but not something that is, is in a sense ordained in any sense. But, but what you're saying, Richard Weikart, is that, that Hitler had a view that this Darwin, Darwinist view of, of life actually was a law to be driven forward, something that, that that was a teleological in that sense that that it what the 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 reason the fittest survived is because that was the way things should be is that is that kind of what i'm getting from you there yes exactly uh that I, and, and i argue in my earlier book hitler's ethics and also in hitler's religion i have a chapter on his morality i believe that he was motivated by evolutionary ethics and i i draw this in in hitler's religion i in that chapter on uh his morality i i make very clear the distinctions between christian ethics and morality on the one hand, and Hitler's vision of morality and ethics on the other hand, which was an evolutionary ethic. Okay, uh, Richard Carrier, time to, to have your say on this now. What, what do you make of this, this particular view that, that if you look at what he said about nature, Hitler clearly equated nature and God, and therefore you can't really call him a theist, and, and in fact it plays into this idea that he saw social Darwinism as, as somehow you know, being the thing ordained in nature, that he was therefore progressing with his, with, with his regime. Yeah, no, it's, it's common to have done, to spoken that, to have spoken that way, even as far back as the Founding Fathers that also talk about nature and, and as if it were the same thing as God and using it in the capitals and so on. But the, the key thing here is that Hitler believed that God made nature, and therefore when you follow the laws of nature, you were actually obeying the will of God. And anyone who tried to go against the laws of nature was going against the will of God, not because nature was God, because nature was created by God and represents and embodies God's will. And we have examples like um, where Weikert constantly refers to this use of the word eternal. Hitler never says past eternal. There's this confusion between future eternal and past eternal. Hitler never says the universe was past eternal. He only says eternal in the sense that it's never going to end. It's always going to, once it's instituted, it's, it's eternal. Uh, so there's no, there's no evidence, actually, that Hitler believed that the universe wasn't created. Uh, it, Hitler actually refers to, uh, you know, what separates man from the animals, again, is that we recognize this creative power. Uh, he was certainly not a young Earth creationist, um, but there's no evidence that he believed that the universe was past eternal. So we can't get this pantheism out of uh, these sort of vague references. He's, he's using the phrase eternal nature to, to point out that God's will is eternal, that once God has instituted uh, the laws of nature, they will last forever, and you, can never, you can't oppose them, you can't change them. Uh, and so this, this isn't pantheism. This is a form of creationism. I mean, um, we could maybe ask Richard again, uh, Richard Weikart, to, to elucidate his references for why he does think it qualifies as pantheism. But but what about the social Darwinism as well? There's this idea that he Hitler ha felt he was obviously in d undertaking some kind of um, progress that was required by the nature of of the Darwinism that that uh, he obviously believed in at some level. Yeah, all of that comes from Christianity, right? There's no nothing in Darwinism says anything about Jews being a separate species. It says, it, nothing says anything about a competition between races. Uh, nothing in there says anything about this idea that you that the struggle requires us to kill weaker races or even weaker people. In fact, Darwin explicitly said that what actually uh, represents us as the pinnacle of evolution is that we've actually recognize the cruelty and and inefficiency of uh, this Darwinian method of, of killing the weak, and that we actually have sympathy for our fellows and actually help the weak, and that actually makes us a stronger and superior species. So when you see all of this stuff perverted and reversed, where is all that stuff coming from? This idea that the Jews are the enemy, that we have to kill them, even if it's being racialized with the Darwinian view, the stuff that's actually being targeting against the Jews, the stuff that's actually talking about like eliminating weaker races and stuff like that, that all comes from prior Christian thought. Okay. Uh, now, it's sorted and it's mixed up, right? So we're confusing religion with race and all of this uh, is going on. But the, 
the idea of the biology comes from Darwinism, but, but the, the idea of attaching it to specific people like the Jews uh, or the blacks or gay people uh, who are also uh, thrown into the concentration camps, all of that concept, uh, is, is actually comes from prior Christian belief. Okay. And it doesn't come from our- it, it's, it's a good argument, Richard. Uh, why can't? Coming back to you again then. Um, two things again there. Um, firstly, he, Richard Carey says the fact is there was a God that, that Hitler believed in behind the nature um, and uh, doesn't necessarily believe in a, in a past eternal universe either, so some kind of mm-hmm. creation. Uh, and secondly, you know, Darwinism is, is neutral uh, as, as a sort of statement of what happens in nature. It was Hitler who attached these religious associations of certain people, types of people and so on, who, who should be eliminated. So uh, just, just a couple of minutes before we have to go to our final break. Go ahead. Yeah, just real quickly on the uh, eternal nature uh, thing, I just invite people to read the context of the passages themselves. Uh, I, God and nature are conflated in those passages, and uh, perhaps Richard Carey and I are just going to have to disagree on that. Um, on the issue of Darwinism and the competition between races, this is just completely wrong. I mean, read The Descent of Man. Uh, uh, in The Descent of Man, it Uh, Darwin spends a good deal of time talking about competition between races and talks about lower races and higher races and how uh, the Australian Aborigines are being uh, beat out in the struggle for existence uh, by the superior European races. I mean, it's it's there in in Darwinism. But I I don't see anywhere in Christianity talk about annihilation of uh, races, extermination, extinction of races. I mean, Darwin has a whole section, by the way, there's a whole section of Descent of Man, several pages long. The section is entitled The Extinction of Races. So this is in Darwinian thought, uh, and so Hitler isn't just making this up. And if you look at Ernst Haeckel's uh, views, who was a very, the, mo- the most famous German Darwinist in the late 19th, early 20th century, Ernst Haeckel very clearly was teaching uh, that different races exterminated other races in the course of the struggle for existence. So uh, Hitler didn't get this from any Christian context that we should go out and exterminate races. This is a, a con, although obviously racism pre-existed Darwinism, but Darwinism integrated that racism into his theory and uh, but, but isn't made it Richard, into a theory Richard where the Carrier's competition point, is going on. Isn't Sorry, Richard Carrier's point that um, Darwin may have been describing what happens in, in the struggle for survival, but that in his own personal reflections on it he he believed humans were you know because of our, our being the pinnacle of this evolutionary process we shouldn't uh, we, we should yes. be, show compassion and, and kindness and and you know to people who you know and so on in contrast to obviously hitler's own views on that uh, actually uh, darwin did at times make comments that were a little bit more positive toward the extermination of races than that at the time he talked about the compassion was talking about internal within societies not in the the racial context but uh, richard Carey's point is well taken about the jews i mean the jews issue that was abs- darwin had absolutely nothing to do with anti-semitism the only times he mentions the jews on a couple of occasions that i've been able to find he makes very positive uh, references toward them but if you also look at the the german darwinists who came after uh, darwin many of them were much more rabidly racist than darwin himself uh, and so Hitler was in the German context, uh, uh, even though we don't have evidence that he uh, specifically read Ernst Haeckel, he certainly was familiar with Haeckel's ideas, and he talks about a number of Haeckel's ideas uh, on a lot of occasions. He certainly believed in uh, human evolution and such. So, uh, okay. yes, the Jews issue that has nothing to do with Darwinism, that was, but that was integrated into it. But it was integrated into it by people before Hitler, too, like Theodor Fritsch, who was one of the most prominent anti-Semite uh, thinkers in the early 20th century. Germany, Fritsch was a very very rabid social Darwinist who uh, believed the Jews were an inferior race and that they were uh, that there was a struggle for existence going on between the Aryans and so did and Chamberlain's ideas about the racial struggle also uh, tie in uh, here as well. We're, we're going to take a quick break. Um, I'm just fascinated by the the history lesson being received on Unbelievable today. Hope you are too. Was Hitler anti-Christian? Our question. Uh, two different perspectives join me as ever on the program. Uh, Richard Carrier and Richard Weikart uh, will be continuing this discussion, concluding it in just a moment's time. In July 2016, Unbelievable, the conference took place in London, a day for any Christian who struggles to share their faith with others. I'm Justin Briley, and I hosted a fantastic day of inspirational sessions with J. John, Gary Habermas, Beth Grove, and many others. Now you've got the chance to watch and listen to over 12 hours of this empowering conference featuring evangelism, apologetics, and the resurrection. Get your DVD at premier.org.uk slash shop and become a confident evangelist today. 
Welcome back to the final part of this week's Unbelievable, the program that brings Christians and non-Christians together. We'll be finishing our discussion on Hitler, whether he was anti-Christian in a moment. Uh, we'll be hearing some of your feedback as well to last week's program a little later. Uh, that was between Mike McCarg or Science Mike, as he's often known online. His story of going from being a Christian to an atheist and finding faith again through science. He was in conversation with an ex-Christian uh, last week. That was Ben Watts, who lost his faith through science and a a varied kind of responses actually to that program Uh, so we'll be hearing some of what uh, you had to say about that don't forget that unbelievable is brought to you as part of faith explored here on premier christian radio and uh, faith explored itself brought to you in association with premier christianity magazine i'm the senior editor of the mag Uh, i know that a number of people who do listen to unbelievable also subscribe to the magazine but if you're not among them and you'd like to find out more about the mag you can find our website at premierchristianity.com Got a very uh, regularly updated blog there. And uh, in fact, I contributed one of the most recent pieces this last week. Uh, if you are a regular listener to Unbelievable, you may remember several weeks ago, I spoke to Max McLean, who is the founder of the uh, Fellowship of Performing Arts and responsible for bringing over an adaptation of C.S. Lewis's Screwtape Letters to a London theatre. Well, it's currently playing and I was able to see it uh, at one of the opening performances last week. And so I put up a review of it. I thought it was a brilliant brilliant sort of show. Uh, I'll read a little bit of my blog out uh, towards the end of today's programme as well. But if you want that blog and uh, other interesting thoughts on culture, opinion, apologetics and much more besides, uh, the Premier Christianity blog is well worth checking out. PremierChristianity.com slash blog. And if you want a free sample copy of the latest magazine and literally just hitting doormats now, our January edition, believe it or not, with loads of really interesting content, uh, you can actually um, get hold of a free sample copy as well at PremierChristianity.com slash free sample okay uh, let's get into the final part of today's show you're listening to unbelievable on premier christian radio so we're concluding our discussion today was hitler anti-christian here on unbelievable this is the show that brings christians and non-christians together for dialogue and debate and our our non-christian is richard carrier historian atheist activist author public speaker and blogger well known and he's been on the show before talking about it in uh, previous years of his mythicist view of jesus um but he's also uh, researched the religious views of hitler uh, detailed in his book hitler homer bible christ make sure there are links to richard and the book from today's uh, episode online premierchristianradio.com slash unbelievable our other richard has been richard weikart professor of history at california state university whose new book hitler's religion the twisted beliefs that drove the third reich aims to show why hitler was neither an atheist nor a christian but a pantheist and that was certainly part of what took up our discussion in the last section of the show um and as we've discussed this this whole question of what hitler really believed and and whether they, these beliefs kind of drove um the the ideology of the nazi party um it's it's been a fascinating discussion gentlemen thank you very much again for for coming on and talking about this richard carrier uh, you you obviously believe that christianity at some level even if christians like richard wycott say it was a perverse form of christianity you still say christianity did have a hand uh, a significant hand in advancing what happened in germany during the war years and before so I mean, obviously, there were people like, you know, famously Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who represented a form of Christianity very much opposed to whatever type of Christianity Hitler claimed to to represent. But for you, does it matter kind of at the end of the day, which types of Christianity we're talking about for you? If if Hitler claimed the word Christian, then Christianity was involved in his rise to power at some level. Is is that what I'm getting from you? Oh, yes. Uh, and, and not just that, it, it's influential, right? So it's influencing, regardless of what you think, uh, how you want to describe his particular religion. Of course, he described it as Christian. Others described it as Christian. The It matches up line by line with positive Christianity, which was widely regarded, widely regarded as a Christian sect. Uh, it was actually regarded as more normative as a Christian sect than the Jehovah's Witnesses, who were one of the most opposed to Hitler's uh, program in Germany. In fact, the, the Jehovah's Witnesses were widely rounded up and thrown in the concentration camps or outright executed. Um, and, and yet I would regard the Jehovah's Witnesses obviously as a Christian sect, uh, and they didn't believe in the divinity of Jesus. They have different uh, uh, set of beliefs uh, than other Christians, and they're excluded by Weikert's definition of Christianity, and I think that's unfortunate because they were some of the, the biggest champions 
of uh, what Weikert would probably believe is, is the Christian reasons to be opposed to Hitler's regime. Uh, and, and a lot of them died for it. Um, but nonetheless, Hitler's got his own perverted form of Christianity. And I see uh, here in America now, I'm really concerned by this kind of Christian nationalism that we see as elected Donald Trump. We have 80% of white evangelicals voted for this guy promoting you know, ideas of uh, uh, demonizing Hispanics and Muslims in much a similar way to the way Hitler was doing it. Uh, now, he's not calling for concentration camps, but neither did Hitler explicitly. Um, but uh, so we see the same idea of this warmongering, uh, this idea that, the, that, uh, that there's a superiority to being strong versus weak. Uh, there's a lot of these similar elements in uh, this evangelical, white evangelical strain that, that's promoting Donald Trump. And you can see how it could get perverted further into a straight-up new form of positive Christianity the same way the Germans did. Uh, and so I think this is something we need to be very vigilant about. We should not try to pretend that Christianity cannot do this or cannot go there. We need to be vigilant. And there's a reason why the phrase never forget uh, has become you know, uh, an, an idiom today. And mm. that's the thing we need to really be armed against. And we have to look at what were the Christian influences that caused Hitler to do what he did, that caused him to pervert, pervert both Christianity and Darwinism and create this, this weird amalgam of the two that is neither Darwinism nor Christianity by Weikert's uh, definition. Okay. So uh, yeah. we need to be constantly vigilant against that and not try to hide it. Okay. Okay. Um, I mean, it sounds um, a little bit like Richard Carey saying there, Richard Weikart, you're you're trying to kind of exclude um, Hitler from Christianity by by tightly defining it as as you know, um, and but that that kind of is to not to give a true picture of of the kind of influences that were at play in the the rise of the Third Reich and so on. Go ahead. Well, again, well, again, I use a pretty expansive definition. It's not a real restrictive definition. It's considered an ecumenical definition, the World Council of Churches definition. And yet, Richard Carey's right; it does exclude the Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, However, we've talked a lot about the influences of Catholicism and Christianity on Hitler, and I'm not denying that there were all sorts of influences of Catholicism and Christianity on Hitler. Uh, it would be stupid, I think, to make that kind of an argument because he's growing up in a context in the, in the Western culture. I think Richard Carrier probably has lots of influences of Christianity in his life, despite the fact that he's an atheist. Uh, so I, I'm not certainly not trying to argue that Hitler had zero influence of Christianity. And I, I would agree with Richard Carey that we do, should examine and see what elements those are. And in my chapter where I talk about Hitler's anti-Semitism, I admit that uh, Christian forms of anti-Semitism did feed into uh, the anti-Semitism that was pervading Germany in the 19th and 20th centuries and that uh, thus fed into Hitler. Although I also then point out that it was it became secular there was new kind of secularized forms of anti-semitism that emerged there but what we haven't yet talked about uh and that maybe i'd like to bring up just in these last couple of minutes is that there were also a lot of anti-christian influences on hitler that we haven't mentioned so far uh, for instance if we ask who was hitler's favorite philosopher as it turns out hitler's favorite philosopher was arthur schopenhauer uh, who was an atheist uh, and Hitler claimed that he carried around Schopenhauer's books and uh, complete works in his backpack when he was in World War One, and makes other claims about Schopenhauer later on. This no idea about Schopenhauer uh, had this sort of an idea of an impersonal will that was extremely important in Hitler's thinking. Hitler also revered uh, Friedrich Nietzsche when he talked about uh, who he thought some of the three greatest philosophers were. Nietzsche was also one of the persons on that list. And Hitler, uh, I have a, actually I have a, a photo in my book. Uh, showing Hitler across from a Nietzsche bust when he was visiting the Nietzsche archives because Hitler visited the Nietzsche archives on several occasions and gave of his own personal funds to the Nietzsche archives. So here we have uh, Hitler, even though it's sometimes he's publicly portraying himself as uh, being Christian, he's publicly portraying himself as being Nietzschean also at the same time, who's of course famous for his dictum, God is dead. That doesn't mean Hitler was an atheist, but it does mean that Hitler is, uh, sees something in Nietzsche that he really likes and Schopenhauer as well. So Hitler revered atheist philosophers and was receiving a lot of influences from non-Christian and atheistic sources uh, as well. It wasn't just Christianity was influencing him. Uh, it was atheism. It was uh, pantheism. There was a whole... Uh, Hitler drew on a wide variety of sources. And yes, I agree with Richard Carey that we should look at all of those and see uh, how they've influenced him and, and try to avoid those uh, problems that... Uh, uh, 
the, and the atrocities that were committed as a result of that. Mm. Fascinating stuff. Um, Richard Carrier, Richard Weikart, thank you very much. Um, both, I think, excellently held your corners as historians uh, on this subject. Uh, really appreciate uh, uh, the, the dialogue that we've had on the programme today. Um, R- Richard Carrier, where should people go to find out more about you and your writings and speaking and books and so on? Uh, everything you can get to through www.richardcarrier.info. That's .info. Um, all my social media, all my books, my online teaching, um, everything you might be interested in, my blogging and so forth, is all warehoused through there. You can find it all through richardcarrier.info. Great. Thank you very much for, for joining us on the program again. Hopefully we, uh, we'll get you on again at some point in 2017. Who knows? Um, great to have you on the program today. Um, Richard Weikart, uh, similarly, thanks to you. Uh, for, for people to find out more about you and the book, where should they go? Well, uh, for this particular book, you're going to have to actually go to Amazon or one of the other websites there. I don't actually have it up on any of the – DarwinToHitler.com has information about some of my earlier works. I don't think we got this one up yet on there. Or just Google my name, uh, uh, my website. And my univer- my, I have a university website, but much too long to <laughs> give it out right here. So just Google my name and you'll find it. Yes, you've written quite a few interesting <laughs> articles related to this as well. I, we didn't get time to discuss it, but the, an interesting discovery you made about yes. a, a doctored yes, fo- I- a photo in, in the book as well. Uh, yes, yeah, that came out pretty recently in the stream uh, about Dr. Hitler's uh, doctored photo of Hitler. Yeah, just Google that doctored photo. My name, W-E-I-K-A-R-T. Google that and you'll probably uh, find that up too. Where I And that, that uh, photo, by the way, is in the book also. Uh, it's a doctored photo of Hitler with a cross over his head, and then it got airbrushed away in a later version. And by the way, that's the only doctored photo that uh, any Nazi historian that I've talked to so far has knows about. Wow. Interesting. Interesting stuff anyway. Um, yeah. Um, let yourselves in for a bit of history. Uh, read the book. Uh, I'll make sure there's links as well from the Unbelievable website as well. But Richard Weikart and Richard Carrier, thank you both for being with me on today's programme. Thanks for having us. Thank you. It's been great. Unbelievable with Justin Brierley. Well, as ever, if you want to get in touch, you can email in unbelievable at premier.org.uk. Look forward to hearing from you that way. Uh, You can also, of course, uh, leave your thoughts on Facebook and Twitter. Follow the show at UnbelievableJB on Twitter, facebook.com slash UnbelievableJB for the show page. Uh, I quite often post the latest show, obviously, thoughts on other things and indeed uh, interesting blogs. Uh, Quite a few of the blogs that uh, Premier Christianity magazine publish uh, end up on the Facebook page of Unbelievable as well Uh, and uh, that includes for instance the review that I put up this last week of the Screwtape Letters new adaptation of C.S. Lewis's classic book uh, playing in London over Christmas and into the new year Uh, and uh, it's a a great adaptation I'll I'll read you in a moment a little bit of the the review that I put up on our blog recently Uh, but you might be interested to know um, those who listened last week and I talked a little bit about the Chris Goswami blog why I don't have enough faith to be an atheist and some of the kickback that got from atheists responding on the unbelievable uh, Facebook page. Uh, Well, uh, we've just put up a response from an atheist, uh, Corey Markham, who's a previous guest a couple of times on this programme. So again, another good reason to go and visit the blog if you can, premierchristianity.com forward slash blog, or simply go onto the unbelievable Facebook page, uh, facebook.com slash unbelievable JB, and you'll find that I've posted it there. But going back to uh, that um, that uh, review uh, of the, the screw tape letters uh, that's been playing in London for the last week and a half or so, and uh, it will be continuing, I think, through to the 7th of January. Uh, this is what I wrote, uh, just the intro at least, to my, my blog review of it. 75 years later, screw tape still steals the show. A new adaptation of C.S. Lewis's Screwtape Letters proves the devil may not have the best music, but he still has most of the best lines. First published in 1942, the Screwtape Letters was the novel that propelled C.S. Lewis to international fame before it even begun to compose the Narnia Chronicles, the children's literature for which he's most well known. The genius of Lewis's book, in which a senior devil Screwtape gives advice to his nephew Wormwood, a junior demon on tempting a human patient on Earth, was the way in which morality was inverted. Good becomes bad and bad becomes good as Screwtape dispenses devilish guidance on how best to provoke the pride, gluttony and other vices of the human his underling has been assigned to. Like the Narnia stories, Screwtape had an appeal beyond a specifically Christian audience and various dramatic adaptations of the book by well-known actors such as John Cleese and Andy Serkis have prov- proved that its themes have continued to speak to the wider public. In the decades since it was written 
avarice, pride and gluttony have never gone away, even if the methods for indulging them have changed. Perhaps this is what convinced Max McLean, founder of Christian Theatre Company, the Fellowship of Performing Arts, to bring his theatrical adaptation of Screwtape to UK shores this Christmas. Sticking closely to the text of the book, this 90-minute one-act play is a dramatic monologue by McLean, who plays the titular role. The only other character is his animated secretary of sorts, Toadpipe, a role much expanded from the book to allow for some dramatic license on stage alongside McLean's spoken words. The Rolling Stones track, Sympathy for the Devil, played as the audience congregated in the small venue of the Park Theatre, Finsbury, where the play runs until the 7th of January. The intimate setting puts you in almost uncomfortably close proximity to Screwtape, who inhabits an office in hell, furnished with a leather armchair, footstool, and an innovative mail chute for the receiving and sending of his correspondence. The bones of the damned provide a decorative backdrop, and there's a suitably fiery red tinge of lighting to the proceedings. Uh, you can read the rest of my blog review of Screwtape now playing in London. Do recommend you go and see it. it, it Max McLean just does a fantastic job as, uh, as the devil Screwtape. Um, uh, that's available at premierchristianity.com forward slash blog or indeed as I say go to the Facebook page, scroll back a few entries uh, back to I think the 12th of December and you'll find that I posted it there as well. Facebook.com slash unbelievable JB Don't forget uh, you can subscribe to Premier Christianity magazine. Might be something nice to do or to give to someone for the new year uh, by going to our website and, and checking that out premierchristianity.com forward slash free sample to get hold of a, a free sample copy see see what you'd be getting yourself into okay let's look at some of your emails and correspondence regarding last week's program and that was mike mccarg and atheist ben watts mike was an atheist well he was a christian then he became an atheist then he's gone back to being a christian well depends on your definition of christian and, and that was one of the things we sort of discussed on the program itself um but he's got a fascinating story um here's some of what you said on the facebook uh, once i put the podcast up on the facebook page um Solomon Parker, great show. If it weren't for Mike, I don't know where I would be. Sounds interesting, Solomon. You might want to flesh that out a bit. Uh, John Osborne says, The show wasn't what I expected, but it was very interesting nevertheless. It made me feel a bit better about my own status of non-materialist atheist slash agnostic. The problem is, with most faith, it seems you're either fully convinced or you're damned. The show made me think that it might be okay to not be sure. Uh, Jennifer said, This is so good. Thanks again, Justin. And um, here's a few of your comments from underneath the show. If you go to the web page itself, where you can listen back to the programme on the Unbelievable Web, website uh, there's various people who have left comments and responses to those comments and so on uh, a regular kind of community really that gathers in the comment section underneath each show week by week uh, here's andrew who said um justin this is a renewed call for you to publish a calendar of upcoming episodes especially where the guest has a publication that's likely to be discussed we as listeners and contributors would like to familiar ourselves with the work prior to an episode publishing a schedule would prime the pump for each week's debate and help eliminate ambiguity and speculation around guests from all quarters um thank you very much uh andrew it is a lovely idea the problem for me is that uh, if i'm completely honest i don't always know what two weeks in advance exactly what is going to be on the show uh it just depends how far ahead i'm able to plan these things and, and it isn't always far enough ahead to to really be able to give good um good notice um uh, particularly as to which which particular weekend they're going to wear but um i i appreciate that it's something maybe we'll try and work towards in the future and uh, and thank you for raising it I, and i'm i'm really humbled really that that you uh see the program as important enough to want to obviously be well read before you actually hear the guests doing their discussions dr richard walsh says good discussion ben commendably maintains his atheistic stance and is not persuaded by mike and his mystical experience on the seashore following an obvious auditory hallucination otherwise known as locution these experiences are not uncommon and usually non-pathological Neuroscience has now successfully demonstrated the neurological causative factors left amyg am 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 amygdaloid hyperactivity particularly undoubtedly responsible. Finding God in the waves is most surely purely anecdotal, subjective, no doubt transformative, but hardly convincing, given the universality of religious experiences as recorded in all culture at all times. Um, the, the odd thing is that, in a, in a sense, Mike McCarg isn't going to disagree that it could all be explained by physical things in the brain i mean that's kind of the point uh the question is is that all that's going on and um 
as I say, I, I, I would recommend the book. Um, uh, you, you may want to get hold of it and, and read it, Dr. Richard Walsh. Tyler B., uh, regarding the apparent contradiction of Mike saying he's both a non-theist and a Christian, it's a shame that Justin or Ben didn't ask the simple questions to provide some basic clarification. Whether Mike believes in the divinity of Jesus, the resurrection, the atonement, etc. However, Mike explained more clearly on the Life After God podcast, hosted by ex-Christian Ryan Bell, that the God he now talks about is closer to Einstein's God, or Tara's God, you refer further to Tara, another regular poster. He clearly doesn't believe in the God of the Bible and therefore not in the divinity of Jesus, the resurrection, the atonement, etc. Um, so Mike belongs to the group of non-believing Christians like Christian atheists, cultural Christians, or those who just follow Christian morality. I have some Christian relatives who don't believe in the resurrection, but they support Christian churches as a force for good in society. Supporters of Christian churches are therefore Christian on that basis. Um, and uh, well, OK, understand. I haven't had a chance to properly listen, actually, to Mike's um, interview with Ryan Bell on the Life After God podcast. I mean, from what he said in our discussion here on Unbelievable was that he had, having gone through this whole experience, approached a more what he called orthodox Christian view that he couldn't give us a kind of you know, objective argument for. But he said, I think in that conversation with Ben, you know, uh, I do have a, a Christology of Christ, a high Christology, but not one that I can give you a sort of um, objective evidence for in the way that I could for, you know, a scientific argument or so on. So I don't know, may, maybe that's one we you would need to ask uh, Mike McCarg directly about exactly where he stands on those kinds of issues. Um, but in any case, uh, thanks for getting in touch on email. Um, quite a few people getting in touch. Uh, Tim F. in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, <laughs> Canada. Don't worry about pronouncing it, he puts in, in brackets. Um, I've been listening faithfully for a number of years and only seem to respond when I'm mad. So I hope you're encouraged in that you receive very few emails from me. But that being said, this week's episode on finding God in the ways, I was nearly cringing the entire time. My issue wasn't with Ben at all. It was almost completely with Mike. Besides the podcast being little more than a plug for his book, the entire stance Mike takes is simply something foreign to Orthodox Christianity. The Bible describes the Christian as a once God-hating, dead to spiritual slave of sin who's chosen redeemed sanctified and supernaturally changed by god to a god-loving sin-hating slave of righteousness who studies loves knows and imbibes the scriptures i've no doubt mike's a nice guy and a pleasure to be around but i had a hard time differentiating what he described as christianity from something i'd get from deepak chopra or opera or well let's face it rob bell dancing around truth trying to define a hodgepodge of unoffensive spiritual spiritualistic all you need is love translucent ungrounded spirituality is not the rock of stumbling cornerstone uncompromisable truth called christianity that caused the death of countless early church christians who refused to bend to rome uh, thank you very much sorry i can't read all of your email but we get we get the message tim uh, you just didn't think that there was any substance to mike's christianity whatever he'd come back to uh, others uh, different points of view here's josh grieve who says dear justin i'd like to chime in on your atheist guest ben's comment regarding mike's take on prayer and what separates that from simple atheistic meditation just listening to how mike described his faith no matter what one may think of his definition or lack thereof regarding god the fact is that he views it as a personal and all-loving entity so in prayer a materialist can do nothing but surrender themselves to a chaotic impersonal force i suppose called nature they can't trust that nature loves them knows them cares about them they're surrendering like a fugitive surrenders to a squad of police he was trying to evade and there might be peace in that but the peace is nothing more than simply accepting the undesirable before an unrelenting force incapable of love or consciousness mike on the other hand believes that he is surrendering himself before an entity likened to a father or a mother whose will he does not pretend to know or understand but whose will he nevertheless trusts or at least desires to trust while i believe the god mike seeks and talks to is more tangible and knowable than mike recognizes it's rather the point of the incarnation everything leading up to it and everything that has happened since i think he's spot on with prayer i won't disagree with job that our prayer can somehow affect divine will but that concept is so mysterious it's almost impossible to know what to do with it so as a general rule at the very least i think mike's approach to prayer is fundamentally orthodox in christian terms finally just to put the spotlight on something i mentioned above in passing i find that many who tend on a track to mystify christianity i would say over mystify as it seems mike and others like peter ends increasingly seem to be doing is to risk missing out on the beauty and raw power of the incarnation whether one is drawn to a more dogmatic approach to christianity or not 
all church dogma that exists has been essentially attempts to safeguard that beautiful and violent reality. Without it, Christianity really isn't Christianity, and that may be fine for some. My mentioning this isn't to challenge Mike, simply to highlight that exciting truth that I think Mike and others have yet to rediscover. And when he does well, I'm excited for Mike, as it is. But I have a feeling that Mike may feel even more of an urgency to help others around him know this very powerful Creator God who entered uh, His own creation. Wonderful show, Justin. Josh. Out in Michigan. Uh, thank you, Josh. Uh, suitably incarnational for this time of year as well. Um, really appreciate uh, everyone who's got in touch. Uh, maybe just time for one more. Um, this from Dave in Glasgow. What an interesting show. Felt you have quite a few people contacting you with difficulties, probably, about Mike's view of the world and that beyond. I found it refreshing, though, and a new lens through which to contemplate my faith. When Mike said God can't be limited by language, it really chimed with me. We as Christians are so ready to place limits on God, I guess, so we can understand him. Why not put our efforts into understanding the work of his hand? Why not celebrate the fact that we can glimpse how he works we should explore freely knowing that god's grace will catch us if we trip i'm just dipping my toe into expanding my faith and your show is a resource i've yet to find a match for it's very intriguing oh and in reference to us all describing god differently i see god as the creator of the maze and a guide that tells us how best to enjoy all the twists and turns it will throw at us i'm currently binge listening to your back catalogue via podcast and i've just made it into 2008 seriously good show justin most of the time smiley face um, and uh, please let Mike know his book will hopefully arrive in my hands via Santa. Thank you, Dave. Um, glad you enjoyed the show and thank you for getting in touch. Um, lots more emails actually on that. Um, no time to read them this time, but maybe in a future edition of the programme. Do come back again at the same time next week when Christmas will be here. Christmas Eve, next Saturday, I'll be talking about the star of Bethlehem. You're unbelievable. <laughs> Yes, sir, uh, we're going to be asking the star of Bethlehem, fact or fiction? Three different perspectives join me on the show next week. We're going to be hearing from Mark Kidger, who's an astronomer with the European Space Agency. He's a, an agnostic. Uh, we're going to be hearing from Aaron Adair. He's an atheist and he's done some research into the star of Bethlehem. He thinks it was just theological fiction. And finally, we'll hear from Colin Nicholl, whose uh, book, The Great Christ Comet, was released last year. He believes the star of Bethlehem was a comet as the book suggests so um we're going to be hearing all three giving their perspectives their different theories i hope you can join us for it same time next week and uh, we wish you in the meantime a very happy run up to christmas see you next time 